Amen. All right, chapter 27 of the book of Acts. Now we're, we're wrapping up here real quickly, the book of Acts. And we see here in this chapter, it's a pretty long chapter. And this is, this is the, um, the whole chapter is dedicated to Paul's travels. They're trying to get, they're basically trying to get, get to Rome, right? And, and here they're just trying to make it to Italy. So they're, they're departing um, from Caesarea, where he was. And if you know the geography of the area at all, you know, there's the Mediterranean Sea, and Caesarea is all the way over, like, on the east, the east coast of the sea. And basically, they're making this. I was looking at, at this whole map and stuff, because they give, they give a lot of destinations here. And, of course, a lot of the destinations that are here, those names aren't used anymore. And I was trying to figure out the, the whole path. It's really interesting. Um, because of watching like where they all go you know they went to this city and 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 it just talks about this whole this details their their whole adventure this whole trip they're making trying to get there and in all the battles that they had well, that's what i mean that's mainly what this chapter deals with but let's let's get dig right into it in the first verse there it says and when it was determined that we should sail into italy they delivered paul and certain other prisoners unto one named julius a centurion of augustus band so basically this guy julius he's a centurion and he's in charge of all the prisoners and everyone that's going to this place and um it says in verse 2 and entering into a ship of Adramidium, we launched, meaning to sail by the coasts of Asia, one Aristarchus of Macedonian of Thessalonica being with us. Now, I find this really interesting that, they, that that second part of verse 2 is thrown in there because we read the whole chapter already and there is no mention of Aristarchus for any other reason throughout the rest of the book of Acts. And Aristarchus is a guy... His name is, is only mentioned in the Bible a handful of times. I think it's five times I found his name mentioned in the Bible. And this is one of the mentions. And it just says that, um, it, you know, just, it, it kind of seems out of place to me. You know, like, why does, it even, why does it even bring up the fact that Aristarchus is, is with them on the boat, right? Because, because you're reading the story, it, it doesn't really change anything. It doesn't really add any, seemingly add anything to it, right? I mean... Um, Never met, brought up again, but he just it just thrown in there that yeah we went onto this boat and we're going to sail by the coast of Asia and you know like they go through where they all where they went and it just says one Aristarchus a Macedonian of Thessalonica being with us that he was with us as well and like I said I did a search for his name and I found five mentions of him in the Bible and um, three times it's in the book of Acts and we've already seen Aristar if you remember we've already seen Aristarchus in earlier chapters of the book of Acts he's mentioned three times this is the last time and then um, in, in the book of Acts he's also mentioned once in Colossians and once in Philemon those are the five times you see this name Aristarchus and it's always talking about the same guy because here it says you know Aristarchus a Macedonian of Thessalonica in other places it says he's from Thessalonica and in other places he's from Macedonia you know he's a Macedonian of Thessalonica and it's the same guy um, but w what I want to bring to light here is that you know, he was definitely a disciple that was doing a lot of good work. And that's always evidence in all of the mentions that we see of Aristarchus. It's like he's always in the middle of, of the most, you know, the things that are happening, of everything that's going on. You know, whereas maybe other disciples are out doing something else. He's like right in the middle of it with Paul. He's going to prison with him. He's going, you know, he's on the boat with them. He's in the storm. He's in the tempest. He's, you know, he's in all these places, but he isn't mentioned very much. Right? He's not, he's not the character in the spotlight. Yet this is a man, I mean, and when we get to heaven, you know, hopefully I'll find out and get to meet Aristarchus and just find all the, all the great things that he did for God that we never know about right now just by reading the Bible because his acts aren't recorded that much at all in the Bible, but he's thrown a mention here in this story, and he's mentioned five times. And um, in Acts 19, he was one of the people that was taken into the theater. If you remember, in Acts 19 is where they're in Ephesus, and and there's this big uproar, and that's where they say, "Great is you know Ephesians, you know Diana of the Ephesians," you know, and they're just like just just chanting that over and over and over again. 
And they had brought, they had caught two of the disciples, and Aristarchus was one of them, and they brought them into the theater. And that was the theater that, um, that Paul was going to go into. But then his friends stopped him. They're like, you know, don't adventure yourself in there. You're going to, you know, they're going to get hurt. They're going to kill you as a mob. And um, so Paul didn't even go in there, but, but Aristarchus, he was one of the guys that they caught in there. That's, that's, that's the first mention that we see of Aristarchus is when he was in there. And then in Acts 20, there's a mention of him just accompanying Paul into Asia. He was just, just mentioned as he was in the company of Paul when he was going into Asia. We see him here, of course, with Paul on the ship, on the ship bound to Italy. And then in Colossians 4, he's mentioned as being a fellow prisoner with Paul. Right? So obviously he's doing the work. He's out there. He's thrown in jail for preaching the word of God as well. And then in Philemon, Paul mentions him as his fellow laborer, someone doing the work with him, as someone to greet, as someone to take care of because, hey, this is my fellow laborer in the gospel. Those are the five mentions of Aristarchus. Now, you don't hear much about him. But it seems evident that he was definitely devoted to serving Christ. I mean, like I said, he was in the middle of it. He was in some of the worst situations. He was also getting thrown into prison. He was in this, in this great tempest and in this storm and in these places. He was, he was in the theater getting, getting thrown, you know, thrown to the wolves, so to speak, and his great mob wanting to kill him. And um, we read mostly about Paul and about you know, the other disciples and, and all these things that they did. But there, are so, there were so many other people at this time that had dedicated their lives to serving God. Now, I want to take a lot of note of, this, of, of just the fact that he's even mentioned at all in the Bible. Because every, nothing is by accident. It's not by accident that the Bible mentions that, that you know, Aristarchus was on, boat, on the boat with him. It's not, it's not a mistake that it was just thrown into the Bible that he was even mentioned these five times. And every single time, it's not a major mention. It's, it's just a small, it's just a small, just a little bit of a credit given to him. And um, I think it's important to note even characters like this in the Bible because we have the great heroes of the faith and they are great men to look up to and to model ourselves after, whether it's Moses, whether it's Paul, whether, you know, whether it's any of these guys, Peter, James, John, you know, all these great people, the great men of the Bible. But let's face it, not everybody is, a Paul, is an Apostle Paul. Not everybody is a Moses, right? I mean, these people were in positions where they got a lot of the attention. They got a lot of the spotlight. They had a lot of, I mean, the focus was on them. Right? You think of Moses. I mean, he was the leader. He was the one at the top. But he's not the only one that was serving God and that was a preacher, right? I mean, you, you hear about these guys and, and there's certain people that God uses and they will be in a position where they will be getting the attention. They will be getting the focus. They will be getting the draw. Okay, but that might not be your job. That might not be the route that, that, that God has you to take. That wasn't the route that Aristarchus was. He's not in the limelight. Yet he was still in the middle of the battle and he was still doing what God had laid out for him to do. And we need to take notice of these people because, again, I mean, you think about the 12 disciples the 12, you know, that, that Jesus Christ picked out. You don't hear about all of those disciples, all 12 of them, throughout the Bible. I mean, there's some of them you only know their names and you don't know anything else about them. It's just they're mentioned. But think about the amount of work that they were doing for Christ. And all of that basically just to, to point out that the whole purpose of serving Christ obviously is not to receive credit in the eyes of man or not, not, to, not to say, oh, well, nobody's noticing my work, right? And, and just want to give up or not want to do it because you feel like, like, oh, this other person's in the spotlight. This other person's getting so much attention that what, you know, what's the point? He's getting all the credit. He's, you know, everybody's looking at him. It doesn't matter. Maybe that's what God wants him doing, and that's who God wants to have in front. You know, the Bible says that, that you know, as a church, we have many members. We don't all have the same function, but we're all part of the same body. We all have different functions to perform that God has laid out for each of us individually um, in our lives. Now, of course, there's a lot of things that are common to everybody. You know, soul winning, reading the Bible, praying, a lot, you know, a lot of these things that, that we preach on regularly are, are areas that we all ought to do. But not everyone's a pastor, not everyone's a piano player, not everyone leads singing, not, you know, not everyone has these other functions within the church. You know, uh, people have different skills that they could use. I mean, 
Some people have more time than others and, you know, the, to, to go out and, and visit people, what, whatever it may be, right? I mean, there's, there's so many different things and we all have different skills. Don't ever think that, you're, um, that your job isn't that important because you're not receiving very much attention or, or seemingly getting much credit. Because even if, even if no man can, can look at you and say, oh, hey, you're doing a great job, keep it up, or, or you're getting very much attention from anyone else, God sees everything that you do. And God knows it. And God is a rewarder of all the work that you will do. Everything you do, He will not let anything go unnoticed that you do for God. Anything that, that you're doing for Him, He sees it all. So a man like Aristarchus, I mean, I think it's cool that he got mentioned at all. But we can see that, that I think one of the reasons, at least, I mean, I don't know exactly for specifically in this chapter why he's mentioned, but maybe it is just because you can look at him and look at this man and say, okay, he's only mentioned a few times, but here he is, right there with Paul, right next to him, sticking with him and doing all this hard work. Now, Paul's the, the focus, right? And he's the one getting, getting uh, the majority of the attention. Yet there, there are other people with him. He has other companions. And Luke was with him. I mean, it says here, you know, it's talking we. We. We went in this. We were in the ship. We did this. We did that. Um, Paul's not alone, even though he's the main, the main character in these stories. Um, so don't let yourself get discouraged because you think that your good works are going unnoticed. Because they're not. Now, by man, maybe they are. You know, maybe I might not notice some of the work that you do. Maybe other people in the church might not notice some of the work you're doing. But obviously, you know, it's not, we're not doing it to be seen of men anyways. We're not, we're not doing, um, um, obeying God's commandments or doing good work for God or, or sacrificing of ourselves to do things for Him to get praises of men. That's not the point. The point is to do it for God anyways. But, I mean, as human beings, you could get discouraged. And try not to let yourself get discouraged because God does see. Now, you might not have someone patting you on the back right now in this life, but those are, those are treasures that you can lay up for yourself. And if you just, just keep that faith of knowing that, that, you know, stick with it. God is faithful. God is true. God will, will reward you. And He'll reward you well. And, um, I just think it's really interesting here, these mentions of Aristarchus as just, just one person, just one man that, that's just kind of mentioned here and there. And we don't know a lot about him, but I guarantee you, he was, I mean, he was serving really well and he, he, um, he did a lot of good works for God. And um, we can see that just in, in the various areas where, I mean, he's getting cast into prison and he's keeping the faith. And um, we could use Aristarchus as an example for ourselves. But let's, um, let's keep reading here in the chapter. Let's look at verse number 3. It says, And the next day we touched at Sidon, and Julius courteously entreated Paul and gave him liberty to go unto his friends to refresh himself. So Julius is, is being real good to Paul, basically. I mean, he's on the boat. He's with a bunch of prisoners. But Julius recognizes, you know, for whatever, I mean, he, he at least recognizes that Paul's doesn't deserve to be a prisoner, probably. But he's giving him liberty. He's saying, you know, he's allowing him to, to basically do what he wants. Um, verse number four, it says, And when we had launched from thence, we sailed under Cyprus, because the winds were contrary. And when we had sailed over the Sea of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. And there the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing into Italy. And he put us therein. So they're basically switching ships. You know, they're making their way. You already see a little bit of difficulty in the travel because the, the winds were contrary. They're not, they're not really getting um, the, the, best, um, the best wind flow for them, for them to make their direct travel. So they get on this other ship, and their, their destination is Italy. And it says in verse 7, And when we had sailed slowly many days, and scarce were come over against Nidus, the wind not suffering us, we sailed under Crete over against Salmoni, and hardly passing it, came unto a place which is called the Fair Havens, nigh whereunto was the city of Lycia. So their travel is going really slow. It's not going as expected. They should be getting a lot more, you know, traveling a lot faster. Obviously, they're sailing. 
They're using the wind, and, and he says they're, they're barely crawling in their ship. They're not making it very far. But they make it unto this place. It's called the Fair Haven. And it says, Nigh were unto. So there's a city over here, Lycia, and they're in this Fair Haven. And it says in verse 9, Now when much time was spent, was spent, and when sailing was now dangerous because the fast was now already passed, Paul admonished them and said, Sirs, and said unto them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only of the lading and ship, but also of our lives. So Paul's giving them a warning. He sees what's going on here, and, and, and he's, you know, from whatever experience or whatever judgment he's using, he's giving them a warning saying, Look, I've got a feeling, I can perceive that the rest of this voyage is going to be is going to be hurtful to us. He's saying not only is the ship going to get damaged, not only is the cargo, the lading that that were that they're transporting, all the wares, all the stuff that that's in the ship. He says, but also of our lives. Like this is going to be dangerous. And he says in verse eleven, um, and it says in verse eleven. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. So basically the centurion's got a decision making. Well, Paul's coming to saying, look, I think this is a bad idea. We should not continue our destination. Let's just stay here. Let's winter here. You know, we don't, we'll, we'll, we'll just, just stay here until, until it's, um, the conditions are right again to travel. And, um, but the master of the sh and the owner of the ship is basically saying, "No, we can do this." So the centurion saying, "Okay, well, I'm going to go with this guy. I mean, he's a sailor, he's a mariner. This is the owner of the ship. He's telling me we could do it, so I'm going to trust him instead of Paul." I mean, we have no um, nothing in the biblical account of Paul says that he was a mariner, he was some kind of sailor, or he had any knowledge of boats and ships. Now we know that he traveled quite a bit, but we see we see nowhere in Scripture. That, that he was, you know, he had any specific, specific special knowledge of, of sailing or boats. So the centurion decides, he's like, you know what, I'm just going to go with the owner of the ship. And then in verse 12 it says, And because the haven was not commodious to winter in, the more part advised to depart thence also, if by any means they might attain to Phoenice and there to winter, which is in haven of Crete and lieth toward the southwest and northwest. Now, well, what I want to point out here is that, you know, oftentimes judgment can be clouded. People's, people's own judgment can be clouded due to, say, like a time constraint or due to, to inconveniences. Because you really want something, you want to do something, and that is a tendency to, to weigh in your mind and, and to cloud your, your better judgment that you ought to have. Um, Paul made a wise judgment call as we can obviously see from the rest of the chapter that we read and all of the trouble and turmoil they had getting stuck in that storm. But the people didn't want to stay there. And one of the reasons why I say it is that the more part said, no, let's leave, let's not stay here because that the haven was not commodious to winter. And so they're saying, this isn't a very... This isn't going to be a pleasant place, you know, very accommodating for us to winter in. If we're going to have to stay here through the winter to, to make it through the rough times where, where it's not a good idea to sail at all, then, you know, we don't want to do it here. We want to push ahead and, and say they had another destination in mind to attain to Phoenice and there to winter. It says, which is in Haven of Crete, and it tells you where that is. Now, there's an important lesson we can learn here about just about making decisions in general. Now, for one, we make decisions, you don't want to make an emotional decision, right? When, when, when you have a decision to make, whatever it may be, uh, the last thing you want to do is let your emotions just kind of take over and, and have that be the basis of why you're making a decision, right? When, when you're deciding to do something, you know, you need to use judgment. You need to be sober and, and let, your, let your better judgment take over instead of, instead of making a decision just based off of like fear or emotion or, or whatever. Um, and you always need to weigh out the risks versus the benefits appropriately as well. See, like these people, you know, yeah, it might have been a little bit uncomfortable to winter there, to, to stay there for a while. But, I mean, they were still near a city. They were still in a place that's much, much better than what ended up happening to them and being stranded on an island and the ship breaking and everything else, right? I mean, there's always, there's always that risk. They need to assess that and say, well, look, the weather is not turning very well for us. And, and apparently, 
when it, as it became winter time, the storms would pick up and the sailing was just not right because that's why they're even talking about hey, let's, we're in a winter somewhere. They were, still, they were planning on stopping and taking a break. Like They obviously weren't going to make it all the way to Italy anyways. They were going to need to stop and take a break, but they just didn't want to do it right there. They're like, no, we could push a little bit farther. We could go a little bit more. It'd be, I guess it would be kind of like thinking, man, I know I need gas in my car, and there's a gas station right here. I could stop offering a gas. But let's just wait for the next one and like kind of hope you make it. And um, you don't know exactly, maybe you don't know exactly where it is or, or, or you think like, man, it doesn't look like we got enough to make it, but we're going to try it anyways. Um, you know, you want to make a right judgment call. You want to assess the risks and, and, and assess the benefit. I mean, how much of a benefit would it really have been for them to, to, to make it to this place, to winter there? You know, how much more comfortable it would be? Um, I don't know. But as I mentioned earlier, you know, Paul was not a mariner. And, and we have no scriptural evidence to say that he had any special knowledge of the sea, but... We do know he traveled quite a bit, and even more important than his own personal experience, and I believe this, is that he had a great, I mean, he, we know he had a great knowledge of God's Word, right? He had, he had a lot of wisdom that he attained through the Word of God, and God's Word will give you wisdom, and there is an understanding and a knowledge that you receive from learning God's Word that can apply to your entire life. There are so many aspects of your life that just by, and it might not seem this way, you might, you might think it doesn't even make that much sense. You might say, well, how is, how is learning and studying the book of Acts, or learning and studying, you know, what, whatever book of the Bible, say, how is that going to help me to make decisions on, on traveling? Or, or whatever, because I believe that, that Paul had this perception, he perceived what was going to happen, not because he had some immense knowledge of the sea, but because he just had some, he had a lot of wisdom. Because he was, he was a man of understanding and knowledge. And, and by learning God's word, God's word gives you knowledge and understanding of things, not just pertaining to the Bible, but pertaining to life in general. I mean, the Bible has answers of everything we need to know about life. And I, be, I fully believe that if you want to, I mean, men of the Bible who know God's word, people who know and study God's word, are intelligent in many other areas of life as well. The more you study and get wisdom, the more you'll know about everything. I, bl I honestly believe if you study and learn the Bible and study the Bible, you will just grow smarter about, about many things. You'll, you'll be able to understand the way the world works better. You'll be able to understand the way things work better. And, and you, can, uh, you can pick up things easier and just gain a better understanding. Now... Maybe in Paul's case, he was able to read people better. He was able to hear, because I'm sure there's a lot of people on board. It wasn't just the captain, right? I mean, I'm sure he was hearing other people's opinions. And he was able to make a good discernment and judgment call based on the things that he was hearing and based on their experience already to that point. They were not having very much success in their travels. They were going really slow. It, it says that, that, you know, even getting to the point where they were. And... They knew every year getting towards the winter time, it's not safe to travel. So Paul's just saying, look, we shouldn't do this. And it's not some expert, expert knowledge that you even need to be able to make a rational, sound decision like this um, on, on how you ought to proceed. You know, this isn't something people these days like to say, oh, well, you are an expert. Well, then you can't talk about it. Yeah. You know, like, like if you're not completely specialized and have only studied this for your entire life, then you can't talk about it. You know, and people give you that, that argument when you try to tell them that, that evolution is, is a hoax, that the theory of evolution is garbage and it's nonsense and it's not backed by science. And they'll say, you know, oh, well, are you a, you know, are you a biochemist? Or are you, a, you know, like, then you can't talk about it. It's like, well, no, but I understand science and I've read and I've studied and I don't need some stupid piece of paper to tell me that, oh, now I can make a judgment call on this, right? I mean, you don't need to be only dealing with one certain subject for your entire life to, to, to be able to know what is true and what's false, to know what's the truth and what's a lie. Um, you could understand the general concepts and you could see evidence enough to make that decision. And I believe that's exactly what Paul was doing here. And that's exactly what I'm saying about learning the Bible and studying the Bible and knowing the Bible. The more you learn that, the more you're going to have those cognitive skills to be able to discern truth from error, to, to discern from truth from lies. When you're only, you know, when you're, when you're, feeding yourself with the truth 
and you know the truth so much more, it's easier to spot a lie. And that's exactly what they do, by the way, when, when people try to spot counterfeit money. They don't study all the wrong ways. They study the, the, the exact, the, the one that's right, the one that's accurate, and say, this is the real thing. They study it and study it and study it. So then when a false, you know, a counterfeit bill comes across their path, they can spot it because they know so well what the true one looks like. And the more you learn the truth from God's word, and the more you, you know that, and, and the more you memorize and just know it, say, like, I know the truth from the Bible, it's a lot easier to spot lies, and, it's, and, it, and it makes your judgment and reasoning a lot better when, when you know the truth so much more um, and it'll help you to be able to filter and discern what is truth and what is a lie now um, the Bible says in Proverbs in Proverbs all throughout the book of Proverbs talk about wisdom and knowledge and and how to gain wisdom but just to just to give you some proof on, on what you know, backing up what I'm excuse me what I'm saying here about you know God's Word just making you smarter in general and giving you that wisdom and knowledge the Bible says in Proverbs 1 Verse number two, it says, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity, to give subtlety to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. So here it's saying, look, you're going to give, you know, by, by learning this wisdom from God's word, the simple, the simple means someone who's not very bright. Right? A simple is someone who's just not very smart. He's saying it gives subtlety to the simple. What's subtlety? Subtlety is, is, is a much deeper understanding. And understanding a nuance is to be subtle about something is, is, requires a lot more intelligence than just being simple about something. Right? Um, and to the young man, knowledge and discretion. The Bible said, look, God's word is going to give you wisdom. It's going to give you knowledge. Discretion. Discretion is being able to, to you know, um, discern between between two things and um, judgment and equity equity is what's right right what's balanced um, judgment making judgments on things making decisions on things it's by God's word will give you um, wisdom and instruction for all these things and in Proverbs 2 verse 6 the Bible says for the Lord giveth wisdom God's the one that gives wisdom Right? If you want to get wisdom, if you want to get understanding, we're going to get it from God. That's the best place to get your wisdom. It says, Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. He keepeth the paths of judgment and preserveth the way of his saints. Then shalt thou understand righteousness and judgment and equity, yea, every good path. I don't know about you, but I believe God at His Word. I believe these words that God is the one that gives us wisdom. God is the one that will give you knowledge. Out of His mouth, God's words will give you the wisdom and the knowledge that you understand, the wisdom and knowledge that you need to understand what is the good path, what is the good way. Hey, Paul understood the good path was not to continue sailing. You say, oh, but that's not in the Bible. You know, it doesn't say anywhere uh, on a daily basis you know, where, what path you should take. No, but you have the wisdom to make that type of a judgment call. You gain that knowledge. You gain an understanding to look at a situation and say, even though the Bible doesn't say on this day you make this decision and just you know, call out each individual decision you're going to make, it gives you the understanding to form your decisions, to form your decision making to say, okay, I can see all this evidence around me. And based on my knowledge of the truth, based on the way I know that the world works, based on the, the wisdom and the knowledge that God has given unto me, I'm going to make this judgment call. And I, believe, I fully believe that that's why Paul was able to per have this perception, to be able to perceive in advance what was going to happen. And I, I, that's also another reason why I believe a lot of times you know, men were called you know, prophets or seers. You, you, have a, you have a good understanding. You can see things that are going to happen before they happen, not because you necessarily can physically see the future, but because you understand the way things are going. I mean, I can look at our country to say, today and say, God's judgment is going to come down on this country, right? And that's a prediction of the future. But... Is it because like I went to sleep and had a vision of it showing me that like this is exactly the way it's going to happen? No. But we have God's word. 
And we know that whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. We know that God is not going to hold this nation guiltless for all of the innocent blood that has been shed that's calling out unto God into heaven. We know he's long-suffering, but we know that it's going to happen. Doubtless it will come. His, his judgment will come on this country. And I mean, that's, that doesn't require anything extra other than just having a knowledge and understanding from God's Word. I mean, I, I don't have to, to, you know, to be a prophet in the sense, so to speak, of, of seeing the future with my eyes to understand that if my child starts standing up on the back of the chair and tries climbing up on the back of it, that that chair is going to fall over, right? I mean, you know that it's going to happen in advance. But it's, it's based on, on your understanding of, of physics and, and what, you know, what's obviously going to happen. Um, and I believe, again, I mean, it's the same thing that, that I believe that Paul has. And I believe that we can all get, attain that from studying God's Word. That you gain so much more understanding of the world and understanding of the truth that, that you can make better decisions and you can understand more about the way the world works um, from God's Word to help you make your decisions going forward in the future. But let's, um, let's continue on here. So they don't, they don't want to stay there, right? They don't want to stay. It's not commodious. And the centurion just decides to go with, instead of believing Paul, he says, you know what? I'm going to go with the, with the, the expert. Right? In this case, this is, this is one of those instances where you know, people always tell you, oh, I'm going to go with the expert. You, can't, you don't have an opinion. Your opinion doesn't matter. I'm going to go with what the expert says. Well, the expert in this case was the, uh, the master and the owner of that ship. He sailed quite a few times. He knows the sea. He knows the way things are going to go. He would be the one that was looked to as the expert, and the expert was wrong, and Paul was right in this situation. So, you know, even the experts, they're not always right. Okay, and that's the way it wasn't here. But anyways, these people, they don't want to, you know, they, no one really wants to stay there. They want to keep on pushing forward. They know we can make it. So let's keep reading here. They were in uh, verse number 13. It says, And when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, loosing thence, they sailed close by Crete. So they need to go north. So the south wind means that the south, it's coming from the south, it's blowing north. It's blowing soft, like it's barely, it's barely coming up. They can feel it. saying, oh, okay, well, we need to go north. So now let's, let's get in the ship and let's get out of here. Because they, they figured that now they're going to be able to sail the direction that they need to go because it just started blowing softly. So they get going, says in verse 14, but not long after there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Eurocladon. Um, this wind had a name. Eurocladon. It was a, it was something that was known by the people that that this wind would come, and it was something that came in the winter time. Just like we know, there's like El Nino, right? There's these different these patterns that happen in weather, and they could be predicted. And every winter, um, and I and I read about this. I didn't know this uh, before, but every winter there's the the north wind blows the wind from the north comes and it blows and and it kind of brings in the winter right and, and it happens like every year so they knew this was going to happen and this had a name Eurocladon because this was i guess it was a really strong wind right it was a strong north wind going the, the opposite direction the way these guys needed to go it says in verse 15 and when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind we let her drive and running under a certain island, which is called Clauda, we had much work to come by the boat, which when they had taken up, they used helps undergirding the ship, and fearing lest they should fall into the quicksands, strake sail, and so were driven. It says, um, so basically, you know, they're, they're trying to go north. They got this, this small south wind. They start going. And, and they don't get very far, and then all of a sudden, a huge wind comes against them. And they, they can't go the way that they want to go, right? So basically, they have to let the wind kind of take them. And now they're coming up to this island, and they have to, like, under, they have to strengthen the, under, the undercarriage of the ship. They need to strengthen it. I don't know if they're worried about rocks, but for whatever reason, they had to strengthen you know, it. I'm not a mariner at all, so I don't understand why they had to do all these things. I just kind of use common sense a little bit. But basically what they're doing is they're strengthening the boat. They're strengthening the ship um, as they're getting close to this island. And then um, 
they were fear, afraid that they were going to fall into these quicksands. So they strike sail. And I looked this up too, striking the sail. They, 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 they kind of let the, the sails down real fast, but maybe not all the way down. And then um, because you got this real strong wind, right, to, to kind of help them get around this area to get through where these quicksands were, there was a lot of danger. So they're having a rough time, basically, is what it boils down to. They're all, like, all hands on deck. They're trying to do whatever they can, strengthening the bottom of the boat. You know, they're in all this turmoil now because they got stuck going, you know, going a certain way. They're out in the sea, and this wind came, is blowing them the other way. They can't fight against this wind. And um, it says in verse 18, And we being exceedingly tossed with a tempest. A tempest is just like a really great storm. It's a real, it's a real big storm. It says, um, and they're being exceedingly tossed on the boat. They're just being tossed back and forth from the waves, from the tempest. The next day they lighten the ship. So lightening the ship, they have to start tossing stuff overboard. They say, we got too much stuff in the ship. We're getting tossed around. We need to lighten some of this stuff so the ship doesn't break, so we can still stay afloat, right? We need to keep the, the, the boat stabilized. And then it says, and the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. So this is, I mean, these are parts of the ship, the tackling the, to, to help, you know, ropes and pulleys and like all these different things to just... To, to help the boat, um, you know, just different various equipment on the boat. They're starting to throw off this equipment to lighten it some more because that's how, how extreme this storm was, how bad this storm was. It says in verse 20, And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. So they get to the point, I mean, they're in a bad spot. It says they couldn't even see the sun, the stars, nothing because of this storm cloud was just covering the sky. And for many days, they're just out there just in the middle of a storm. The storm is not passing. And when, you know, they're saying and for many days when this is going on and they're, it's not a small storm either. I mean, they're, they're in a raging storm for many days on end getting tossed around. They all got discouraged. They said all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. Now, I want to bring this up that because people like to rip things out of context all the time. We're going to see one more mention of this in this story. Just because the Bible uses the word saved, it's not always talking about salvation of your soul. All right? Obviously. We can see that anyone who's honest, use even the slightest bit of discernment, can see that when it says all hope that we should be saved was then taken away, it's not talking about their souls going to hell. It's talking about them being in the middle of this storm and their lives physically being saved. But um, I just want to point that out because people will try to do that to you. Always make sure you understand where the context is. Um, and that's when people always do that. I was just talking to, a, to a, one of Jehovah's false witnesses today. Um, and he was saying, well, he that endureth unto the end shall be saved. Right? And that's a total misunderstanding. That's a, that's a perfect example of someone saying, oh, well, the Bible says saved there. So it must just be talking about your eternal salvation. No. Get the context. Matthew 24 is talking about the tribulation period when people are going to be going through a tribulation. And if you endure unto the end of that tribulation, then you will physically be spared from being martyred or from dying based on all of that tribulation if you endure unto the end. That's all it's talking about. Real simple in the context. But you have to understand what the context is. Just because the word saved is used is not always talking about our eternal salvation. But um, obviously it's a terrible storm that they're caught in here. And this is one of those defining moments. And, and you've all pro everyone's probably had something similar to this where everything is just going wrong, right? Like you, may, you make a decision. You make a decision in your life and it's the wrong decision. And then it's like, now you're stuck in the middle of it reaping the consequences of that decision. And you're just looking back thinking like, if I would have just not done this you know we wouldn't be where we're at right now if they would have just listened to paul right if they would have just just stayed in the fair haven now the, the fair haven is a lot better than being in the middle of this tempest being tossed about and having to throw the equipment off of the boat to try to just stay alive so that the boat doesn't sink in the middle of the sea and you and everyone just drowns in this great storm and and i'm sure this is going through everybody's mind what a bad choice they made and, and, and man, how did we get into this mess? And everything just went wrong. And then this is what Paul says. Look at verse 21. It says, but after long absence. So Paul withheld himself for a long time. He, he 
didn't say anything. After long absence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, you should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete and to have gained this harm and loss. So what does Paul say? I told you so. <laughs> And obviously that's not probably something that any of them wanted to hear because no one ever wants to hear, you know, I told you so. But, I mean, how can you not? You know, he's in the middle of this too, right? I mean, he was, he's kind of stuck because he, he was a prisoner, right? He, didn't, he couldn't just say, well, you guys all go on ahead. I'm going to stay here, right? I mean, the centurion wouldn't have allowed that. Now, he was giving him liberty among his friends and he was treating him courteously, but he still had to go with them. So Paul's like, I told you not to go there. I told you not to, not to do those things. You know, we should have just stayed there. And he said, you should have listened to me. But see, this also gives him more credibility now for the people to listen to him. When, when he said something that, was, you know, that no one really wanted to listen to, and, and it's, come, it's come true, now all of a sudden, people probably have a lot more respect until the things that he's going to say. You're going to, and you know, the same thing happened recently with, um, you know, with the housing bubble crashes and things like that. There's a lot of different economists and there's a lot of different people in politics who are like, you know, oh, everything's going great. You know, the 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 mainstream is saying it's kind of treating it like being on this great roller coaster. You know, the prices just keep going up, 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 up. Everything's great. But then there's other people saying, no, this is a bubble. This is going to crash, and this is what's going to happen. And those people that predicted that were right, now they have a lot of credibility. They have a lot of, a lot of credit to their name to say, oh, okay, well, yeah, you did say this. You did say this was going to happen, and this is exactly what happened. Right? I mean, beforehand, people look at them and say, oh, yeah, you don't know what you're talking about. Right? Just the same thing with Paul. Like, oh, yeah, you don't know what you're talking about. The master of the ship knows more than you. I'm going to go with what he says. But then when Paul says, you know, hey, I perceive that this, this, her is gonna, this voyage is going to be damaged, not only to the lading and ship, which is exactly what happened. They had to toss their lading out. They had to toss all of their, their, their equipment, everything off the ship. But he said also to our lives. And they were fearful for their lives. They lost all hope that they were going to be safe. So everything that Paul said now is coming to pass. So he's going to gain this credibility. But see, he doesn't just stop there and say, okay, well, I told you so. You should have listened to me. I think he says it also because he's offering them hope now. He says in verse, in verse 22, look what he says. He says, but, and now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. He's saying, look, we're going to lose the ship, but you're all going to be alive. So, so you can you could take hope in that because they all had no hope. I mean, they, they had all hope that they should be saved was lost. Nobody thought, you know, they all thought that they were going to die. And Paul's now saying, look, you should have listened to me, but be of good cheer. Don't, you know, don't, don't be discouraged. You're all still going to be alive. Verse number 23 explains why he's giving them that hope. Verse 23 says, For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul. Thou must be brought before Caesar. And lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. So he's saying, look, you don't have to fear because God spoke to me last night and he told me, look, he's like, I serve God. I serve Jesus Christ. He told me, he says, fear not because you have to go and be brought before Caesar. That's going to happen. And when God tells you something like that and God makes you a promise, you could, you could rest assured that it will come to pass. And not only that, he also told them that God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. So God promised them too. He said, look, everybody that's in your company, all of them will make it. You guys will all make it through this, this, um, this event, this storm. And um, that's why he tells them, look, you could be happy. He says, for I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. And that's the way that we ought to live our lives every single day. You believe God. I mean, believe God that, that He is faithful. Believe God that He's going to see the works that you do. Believe God, you know, obviously for your salvation is the, the most important thing that we have to believe Him for and trust that. Look, we know, we have faith that, that one day, you know, when we breathe our last breath, we're going to go to heaven because we received the gift of salvation. Now, God was directing Paul's path here because he was saying, no, you have to be brought before Caesar. Now, it would have been better for them if they had listened to Paul, but because God has plans for Paul, he still extends mercy on all of them. So, like, being around Paul um, by these people that, that probably would have died if Paul wasn't in their company and they were just doing this, this journey on their own, 
they probably would have died in that storm from the decisions they made. But because Paul was there and God was showing mercy on Paul and on everyone else there, and, and God had plans for Paul saying, look, no, this is where I want you to be. Um, that, that, that mercy extended unto everyone that was there. And so that's um, you know, another point. Be careful who you hang out with and pay attention to who you spend your time with because you know, if, you're, if, you're all, if your best friends are, are those are people that are just really worldly or not even saved, you know, what good is going to come? They're not walking in God's path. They're not, they're, not, they're not following the steps that God would have laid out for them. And a lot of bad things will happen when you're not, when you're not in God's will. We're not doing what God wants you to do. You don't want to be in the collateral damage area of, of that, so to speak. But at the same token, are you spending time with people who are godly and righteous and doing that which is right? Hey, those are the best people to spend your time with because if they're doing what's right, even in these worst storms and these worst situations, hey, if God's got a plan for them and something to do, then He's going to make sure that nothing's going to happen to you. He'll make sure that you're protected and you might want to be one of these other people around Paul in this type of situation where God's going to save everybody because of the fact that Paul is there and because Paul has a certain place that he needs to be. Um, so, you know, pay attention to the people who you're spending most of your time with. Um, I believe that's important. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 26 says, Howbeit we must be cast upon a certain island. So he's telling them, look, we're going to be thrown on an island and, and we're going to lose the ship, but we're all going to be alive. It says in verse 27, But when the fourteenth night was come, as we were driven up and down in Adria, about midnight the shipmen deemed that they drew near to some country and sounded and found it twenty fathoms. And when they had gone a little further, they sounded again and found it 15 fathoms. So they're coming up. It's the middle of the night and they're coming up on this. They're saying like they know that there's land there, but they can't see it because it's the middle of the night. So they, they make a sound and they're, they're obviously able to tell um, by the echo how, how far away they are. So they make a sound and they say, okay, there's land over there because it's, you know, obviously the, the sound is returning to them and they're able to calculate that it's you know, 20 fathoms. A fathom is like six feet. I had to look that up. So it's like 120 feet and then they're saying, okay, now it's 15, feet, you know, 15 fathoms. So then they, 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 they park it. It says, then fearing lest we should have fallen upon rocks, they cast four anchors out of the stern and wished for the day. So now they're like, okay. Obviously, as you get closer to land, you don't know there could be rocks, you know, big boulders or even some rocks under the water that you can't even see that could just destroy the ship. So they say, okay, we're going we're gonna to drop the anchors out of the back. The stern's the back of the boat. They're going to drop anchor and now they're just waiting, for, they're just hoping for the day, right? I mean, they're still in a storm. They're still, they're still in rough water, but they're, gonna, they're, they're parking it there because they want to they wanna get to land and, and, and wait wherever, you know, wherever they're at. Um, and it says in verse 30, And as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship, when they had let down the boat into the sea under color as though they would have cast anchors out of the foreship, Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, Except these abide in the ship, ye cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut off the ropes of the boat and let her fall off. So here we see some of the crew is going, and they're pretending it's under color of. It's, it's they're, they're, they're going... Um, and deceiving them, saying that like, okay, we're going to go let down these anchors, when really they were letting down the lifeboat to, to go and save themselves. They were trying to abandon ship and just, uh, just say, see ya, you know, and everyone else left on board because they were close to land. So now they were able to get in this smaller boat and they know that, hey, because not everyone in the ship was going to fit on their small little lifeboats. There were a lot of people on board. It was like 170 people. So I, don't, I don't remember the exact number it says in here. Um, but there are a lot of people on board. So not everyone's going to finish these lifeboats. So they're saying, hey, well, let's save ourselves and get out of here. Right? Paul sees this happening. And they were going, it says, under color of. So, like, so a lot of times you'll hear things like, under color of law, someone was trying to do this. Basically, they're saying people are, are pretending like that there's some law or that, 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 that it's lawful to do a certain thing when it's not. And what they're doing is illegal. It's not lawful. But they're, they're using that. As a um, as a cloak, as a, as a you know, as a as a disguise, so to speak, of well, under color of law, I'm doing this, and under color of of setting out the anchors, saying we're gonna, yeah, we're just gonna go lay the anchors out. They were really gonna go and get in lifeboat. Paul sees this happening, and he says, "I'm sure," and said, "Hey, look, unless these guys stay on board, you know, we can't be saved." 
And so they go over there and they cut the, the ropes off and let the boat fall into the water. And again, going back to my previous point, that just because it says the word save there, it's obviously not talking about their eternal soul. saying like, oh no, unless these guys stay on the boat, your soul is going to go to hell. You know, like that's ridiculous. That's silly. It doesn't even make any sense. Um, it's just talking about physically that they st he still needs the crew on board to navigate the new and, and you know land this ship in order for everyone to survive. You can't have the whole crew gone and leave them with a bunch of send, you know soldiers and prisoners, right? I mean they're not going to be able to take care of the ship. They need to. So in order for us to be saved, look, these guys need to stay on board too. That's all he's saying there. Let's keep reading. There. Look at verse number thirty-three. It says, And while the day was coming on, Paul besought them all to take meat, saying, This day is the fourteenth day that you have tarried and continued fasting, having taken nothing. Wherefore, I pray you to take some meat, for this is for your health. For there shall not an hair fall from the head of any of you. Now, I mentioned this in one of my previous sermons on Sunday. People often will fast in times of trouble. Now, this was a really long fast that they were taking. Fourteen days, two weeks. You imagine going two weeks without eating. That's a long time. And not only are they not eating, but I mean, they're working and they're toiling and they're struggling. Man, <laughs> this sounds really lame for me because like, I've never gone on a really long fast. I've definitely fasted before. I think it's a good thing to do. I think everybody should fast. I think, I think it's something that, that you ought to do. There's a lot of good reasons for it. And, and I'm going to preach a sermon soon about fasting and, and, why, and what the benefits are and why, we, why I think we should do it. But um, my fast usually lasts a day. That's, tip, that's, that's what I do. And on those days when I don't eat, I don't really want to, I don't plan on doing any hard work. Because that's just going to make you more hungry. You know, I mean, if you're out there toiling, you know, like I'm not going to go, you know, digging ditches in my yard and everything else and saying that's the day that I'm going to choose to fast. Now, maybe I'm a wimp, but that's, you know, I just, I kind of pick and choose, okay, well, I'm going to fast. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to try to go out of my way to do a lot of extra work. Now, obviously, I'm going to do whatever I need to do for the day, but um, these guys, they were, they were toiling. I mean, they were working hard just trying to stay alive. They're getting tossed around, and they're fasting, and it's 14 days they haven't eaten, and um, we see here, this is real extreme. That kind of, that kind of emphasizes how how brutal this storm must have been for them, for them to be fasting for that long. People often fast, you, you see in the, in the Bible, when they're in times of extreme trouble. One of those times was when Esther, if you remember the book of Esther, when Esther was about to go to the king, they had a law, a rule that says, unless you were beckoned by the king, unless you were summoned, like you can't just go and, and, and go in front of the king unless he calls you. This is because if you do that, then... It's like the death penalty unless the king you know, lays out his scepter and, and basically grants mercy unto you. But that would have the punishment of the death penalty by coming in unannounced to the king. But that's what Esther had to do. So she knew that. She knew what the consequences could be, that she could be losing her life over going to the king over that. So she had asked, she said, okay, she, um, she talked to... Um, Mordecai and said, okay, tell everyone, you know, I'm gonna, we're all going to fast. You tell everyone else to fast. You know, we're all going to fast and pray unto God because it's a big deal. You know, I'm risking my life here. So that's what they did. They fasted. They prayed. Um, David fasted. If you remember when um, God afflicted the son that he had with Bathsheba, um, when he committed adultery and Bathsheba got pregnant, um, before she had Solomon, before when she got pregnant with the, with that first child, God afflicted that child, and David prayed and he fasted because he didn't want the child to die, right? So he it was an extreme situation, you know. There's this event going on, so David's just just praying, fasting, you know, mourning and and um, trying to get a hold of God that way. And then also the king of Nineveh. He proclaimed a fast. We, we saw this in Jonah on, on Sunday night when I preached about that a week ago. When Jonah came and preached, you know, this destructive message from, you know, yet 40 days and God's going to destroy this city. Well, the king heard that. He believed the message. They believed God and said, okay, well, he proclaimed a fast. And they all, you know, put on sackcloth and ashes and they mourned and they fasted. 
because it was an extreme situation because they were about to be destroyed. Right? So in many situations in the Bible, you'll see when people are fasting, especially fasting a lot, like, like more than a day, maybe a few days, or in this case, 14 days, it's because they're going through some type of really, really difficult situation. And it's a, real, it's a time of extreme trouble. And it says in, um, in Matthew 9... Verse 14, the Bible says, Then came to him the disciples of John, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast oft, meaning often, but thy disciples fast not? So they're asking, say, look, your disciples, how come they don't fast? You know, we're fasting, the Pharisees are fasting. How come your disciples aren't fasting? And this is what they're asking Jesus. But Jesus answers them, and this is where we get a, a good insight on fasting itself. It says, And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them, and then shall they fast. Notice how he uses the word mourn, like mourning, grieving, being sad, with fasting. He kind of equates the two. Mourning, you're going through, when you go through something really difficult, when you're, when you're in a situation where it looks like all hope is lost and you're going to die, hey, that's a very mournful time. That's a sad time. That's not a, not a happy, joyous time. And he's saying, look, that's when you fast, when, when, it's, when it's more of like a time of mourning, when you're in a time of difficulty and trouble. And um, see, Paul understood the fast, but he even said that they needed to eat for their health. So he's saying, look, like he knows what fasting is all about, right? He's been in plenty of troubles. He's fasted plenty of times. But he's saying, look, it's been 14 days. You guys have been toiling and working. You need to, you need to eat. I mean, you can only go so long without eating before you just die. Your body obviously needs food unless God is going to miraculously keep you alive. You know, your body needs food to survive. And yeah, it's great to fast and it, there's nothing wrong with it. But he's saying, look, you guys need to eat. It's been two weeks. It's been 14 days. You need to eat. And um, so that's what they do. So it says in verse um, 35, it says, And when he had thus spoken, he took bread and gave thanks to God in presence of them all. So the first thing is he's thanking God. I mean, they're through the storm. They're tolling everything else. But what does he do when he breaks bread? He gives God thanks. And, um, and when he had broken it, he began to eat. Then were they all of good cheer, and they also took some meat. So they, they took comfort in that fact. They, you know, they see Paul. Paul gives thanks unto God. He's, they, they've been hearing his message anyways, because now it's already been a few more days since he said that they were going to you know, be of good cheer because God's going to save them all. And, um, but at this point now, they're, you know, they're in front of this land, and you know, Paul's with them, and, and he talks some sense into them. It's like, yeah, you're right. And their mood changes a little bit, so they get some food in them, and, um, and they, you know, their mood changes a lot. And um, let's keep reading here. Verse 37 says, and, and we were in all in the ship, 200, three score and 16 souls. So 276 people were in that boat, which is why 276 feet people are not going to fit in the life rafts, in the lifeboats, right? Those little small ones. 276 people. And it says, And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship and cast out the wheat into the sea. And when it was day, they knew not the land, but they discovered a certain creek with a shore, into the which they were minded if it were possible to thrust in the ship. So when it says they knew not the land, it means they didn't know. They, they had no idea where, where exactly they were. Right? Because they had been in the storm. They couldn't see. And, and again, when it said that the, the stars and the, and the moon and the sun were covered by the night, that's what they used for their navigation. They didn't have GPS. Right? They couldn't, they couldn't just read on a dial and say, oh yeah, here's where we're at. You know? They used the stars. So when you can't see for many days, when, when you have no way of knowing and you're stuck in this storm and you're just trying to keep the boat afloat, you're not navigating. You're not, you're not keeping track of where you're at. And if you've ever been out in the sea, I mean, you can, you can get pushed over all over the place with the winds, with the waves, and you can get way off course really easily to where you have no idea where you're at. And um, so they see this land. They're like, well, we don't know what land this is. This doesn't look familiar unto us. But they saw this creek, and they were thinking, okay, well, we can, you know, we'll try to, to dock the boat there. We're going to try to come up on this creek and just, and just land the boat here in that area. So that's what they try to do. It says in verse 40, and when they had taken up the anchors, they committed themselves unto the sea and loosed the rudder bands and hoised up the mainsail to the wind and made towards shore. So they're just going um, all out, you know, put the mainsail 
they hoist it up and um, and they made toward the shore. It says, and falling into a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground. So the, the, the bottom of the ship gets stuck. It says, and the fore part stuck fast and remained unmovable, but the hinder part was broken with the violence of the wave. So, so they, they, they basically land the ship in, the front part's just completely stuck in the ground, but the back part's not. And because the, there's this huge storm and it's where two seas meet, so the waves are probably coming kind of in different directions, just slamming into the boat. It's, it's enough to, to break the back of that boat, to break the ship. And um, it says in verse 42, And the soldiers' counsel was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim out and escape. So now the soldiers are saying, look, we got prisoners on board. You know, we're in a shipwreck. We need to get out. We don't want these guys escaping, so let's just kill them. That was their solution. Say, okay, we'll kill these guys and then we'll figure out how to get to land or whatever and save ourselves. But we can't be responsible for these guys, you know, getting away from us and using this as their opportunity to escape because there's a shipwreck. But then it says in verse 43, but the centurion willing to save Paul kept them from their purpose and commanded that they which, should, which could swim should cast themselves first into the sea and get to land, and the rest, some on boards and some on broken pieces of the ship. And so it came to pass that they escaped all safe to land. Now, Paul was obviously in good standing with the centurion. Paul was obviously, you know, um, someone that the centurion even cared about enough to want to save him. Now, you know, he may not have cared about any of the other you know, prisoners that were there, but Paul, he was like, no, we can save all these people. We can do it because he didn't want to see Paul get killed. He knew Paul was a good man. Paul was there helping him out. Paul just, and Paul just had to, you know, had him break bread and everything else and, and cheered him up. And he was right about everything that happened. And, and even from the beginning, the centurion was giving him, you know, treating him courteously. So... You know, Paul lived a life where, where he tried to live peaceably with all men, you know, as much as, as is possible, as much as lieth within you. And that's what we ought to do, too. There's nothing wrong with being, in, and you ought to be, actually. It's not that there's nothing wrong with it. You ought to be in good favor with God and with man. Now, the only time where you should fall out of favor with man is when it contradicts, you know, being in favor with God. So if, if something arises where... In order to be in good favor with men, you have to do something that's getting you out of favor with God, then you don't do that. You say, okay, well, I'm not going to be in favor with men. I'm going to obey God. That's first and foremost. But if you are serving God and you are doing just fine with God and you're doing everything that's right, then yeah, you ought to be in favor with man too. I mean, there's no reason to cause strife or fights or, 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 or anything like that. I mean, you ought to be in good graces with God and with man. And, um, and Paul here was, and, and you see how it benefits him because now the centurion saying, okay, well, no, we're gonna, I'm going to figure this out. We can still do this. Look, you soldiers that can swim, you swim to shore first. And then we'll send the prisoners out so that you can have soldiers on board and soldier, you know, soldiers on land. You're not, no one's going to escape. And then you got pieces of boards and everything else. Everyone's going to make it to land. And that is exactly what happened. And as always, God's promise holds true. The very promise that God gave Paul saying, look, the ship is going to be destroyed. The ship got destroyed, but you're not going to lose anybody. Everybody made it safe unto land. God's word, we, we, could take, we could hold God to be true. We could believe him like Paul did. He believed God at his word and, um, and he came through. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the Bible. Thank you for the book of Acts, dear God. There's so many exciting things that happen here. And there's, there's so many men of faith, dear Lord. I pray that you would please work in our hearts. Help us to have the same faith, dear Lord, and, and even greater faith to, to trust you at your word. Even in the worst situations, dear God, in the worst storms of our life, help us to stay faithful, dear Lord. Help us to stay believing you and trusting on you, dear God, because we know that you'll pull through. And um, Lord, we thank you so much. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right.